now. The Radio Waymo Breakfast. Kiwi. Kiwi. In a land of virgin wilderness and extremes, when remoteness bred self-sufficiency and necessity was the mother of invention, a lot of uh, technology and a lot of toys just weren't available on the shelves. It wasn't there to buy. You went and built it for yourself. You figured out how to make it and you made it. A maverick few explored a new concept of fun. The film we're looking at now is called Last Paradise. It's been called uh, a greatest hits compilation of um, footage shot by Clive Neeson over um, 45 years uh, of uh, adventure, sports, um, fantastic scenery from, uh, from New Zealand and all around the world. Uh, my guest is Clive Neeson, who um, has put the documentary together, screening at the International Film Festival. G'day, g'day to you, Clive. Uh, good morning, Glenn. And where are we talking to you today? I, I'd imagine you'd be, you'd be near a beach. You've got to be near a beach. Uh, I am about 50 metres from, from the surf this morning, yes. Wow, whereabouts? <laughs> At an Okura in uh, Taranaki. Oh, wow, and that's home? Uh, that's home, that's right. What a spot. Mm. Um, I, I'd, I'd imagine that you haven't spent um, hardly any time in your whole life far away from a beach. Well, a good part of the movie, as you know, is the mountains as well, so uh, wherever the um, the action sports is, and of course, this kind of life you have to finance as well, so I've, I've done my time in laboratories and offices because I'm a physicist, actually, and so I've had to pay my way, and uh, they've had these interludes of... Uh, of working in totally different spaces at times. It's kind of funny because because you say um, you're a, you're a physicist, which totally breaks the kind of um, the the mould that you'd imagine a um, an adventure sportsman to sort of be. You know, um, you'd, you'd imagine most adventure sportsmen are the kind of the the the, the blonde haired kind of beach bum sort of type that they don't do much else other than the adventure sports. Yes, I think in the day, uh, now I think that uh, they come from both sides, but in the day I probably was personally a bit of an oddball, um, having an unusual background, mm. and um, <clears throat> sort of walked with a, a foot in both camps, really. On one hand, uh, hanging out with these uh, sort of daredevil oddball guys, yeah. and the other with the academic world. Um, but as you see in the movie, the, the extreme sports journey is actually dealt with from quite a sort of scientific perspective. And so we've, we've brought... Um, not only the science into it, actually we've, we've attached it to globally significant issues, which has been a great vehicle. It's, uh, the extreme sports journey has been a great vehicle to, I suppose, um, enlighten people on the way the world was and the way the world is going. So it's, uh, I think it's more than just a montage of, of pictures. It's the story, really, that was the main focus of this, yeah. to employ that, that very unusual footage into a story which could be told from a very different perspective and experiential one such that you feel like you're going on this 45 year journey and thankfully you decided to pick up the camera at such an early time as well um do you, do you remember making your first outdoor adventure film i never actually made a film until the last four years uh, before that it was just really um and intrigued with what we were doing at the time, knowing it was very unusual, knowing that the people that we were doing it with were quite unusual. And that I guess when you have a passion for something, you just want to put it in a preserving jar. Yeah. And that's what film was for me then. It was a way of capturing it so that people who weren't involved in it uh, could appreciate what we were doing and that one day maybe we could look back on it as well. And so that was a drive for me. And, and now, of course, these sports have become more mainstream there's a lot more intrigue in it, and so it's been worthwhile restoring this film. But you've been able to capture some of the early technologies used in some of these sports, like the, the, the big longboards, the big surfboards. Yes, yes. Um, it, it started very young. I mean, I was, I was probably about, oh, I, I don't know if it was 12 or 15 when I, when I bought a broken camera from a second-hand shop and, yeah. for $7 and, and then pulled it to pieces. It was a wind-up camera, and then restored it. And so, for, for pretty much no money at all, I was—I uh, had a camera and I could film. And uh, so then it was just basically digging vegetables, is what I used to do for a job. Yeah. Um, after school, and I—I I saved up money for my first roll of film, and so on and so on. So it did start very early. And then, my father had a chicken house that um, we used to raise chickens in for a bit of extra money. 
and we then cordoned off a bit of that and blew the cobwebs out and started uh, making these water housings that we could take the camera into unusual environments mm. uh, in of course into the big waves and so on and that um, and mounting them on the, t- the surfboard to get that uh, experiential feel the feel that the the audience was participating rather than watching it from afar. And I suppose it's really no co- coincidence because, you know, um, like minds all f- kind of flock together, but, but your friends included AJ a- 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 Hackett, Alan Byrne, Tom Deacon, um, C- uh, Kristen um, Boyce as well. So many um, well-known names in the adventure sports industry. Well, the, these mature participants, if you might call them that, back then they were really it. Um, there weren't very many people at all doing this, so we were a fringe bunch. Um, rugby was pretty much what we had to do at school, and these breakaway individuals, uh, mavericks if you like, ended up, of course, always running into each other, whether it be on the mountains or, or at the coast and exploring wherever in the wilderness. Uh, you tended to, to bump into each other and you recognise that, hey, there's that guy from... Um, from you know the South Island, yeah. and so you end up becoming mates and doing stuff together. And of course, uh, as the years go by, uh, you look back, and those guys ended up being the pioneers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and some of them have come, are gone to set up um, very successful businesses around what was originally just for fun. Yes, and that's one of the themes of the movie: is that um, in every experience leads to an opportunity, and, and some took it all the way. Now, the the title of the film, of course, gives a clue sort of to the second sort of meaning and part of the film, Last Paradise. Um, would you say that over the 45 years, you've strived to kind of keep ahead of development and pollution and trying to find the, the last unspoilt place on Earth? Yes, yeah, so that is the film, uh, sorry, the theme of the film, mm. or one of the threads of the film. Um, I don't think it was so much uh, at that stage uh, trying to, to keep ahead of it. I think it was... Oh, I see what you mean there. Yes, it was It was trying to find the next frontier. Yeah. Uh, because we had started in a, an environment where we were basically it and there was no, uh, no what you might say, other. There's no crowd. Yeah. And uh, we're used to having it to ourselves. And, yeah. <laughs> and even in the 70s. Uh, Bali would be an example. Yes, yes, uh, um, as these places become more discovered, uh, you move on and you find new and new and new places. And through the movie, as we moved from country to country and found a new frontier and then saw that frontier become uh, relinquished to, to tourism, for example, uh, we moved on. And then, as you can see in the movie, there comes a point where there is only one place left. <laughs> and it's God's own. Pardon me? It's God's own. Well, it's kind of, kind well, you of know, God's own. There's a own. twist in the story, so yeah. you, you're going to have to see that in the yeah. movie. But it, but, it, but it is the way it was and the, the way it is and the way it will be. Yeah. Mm. Would you say your view of the future of some of these special spots around the world, including here in New Zealand, would you say you're pessimistic about their future? No, I take a realistic view. Yeah? Um, and, in fact, you can see that a, a lot of the between lines messages which are in the movie or that we learn through the movie uh, is that there is a way of turning it around and these characters for example in the movie who were um, were forced almost to play outside and not inside Mm. have become great ambassadors of the environment and one of the ways in which we can turn around this trend is to make sure that kids today do grow to love the wilderness and Mm. that comes from playing out there unfortunately they're not which is, of course, cause for pessimism. Yeah. But, but the other side is that if we do have a chance, if we know what the elements of change are, we do have a chance of changing that. Yeah. Clive, you haven't slowed down at all over the, over the last 45 years. Um, still trying. <laughs> T- trying to slow down? Still trying. <laughs> well, it's a, um, it's a fabulous film and, and what a, a great um, documentation of the last 45 years as well. It is screening at the New Zealand International Film Festival uh, on Friday, first of all, at Sky City Theatre at 8.30pm and then Sunday the 25th at Sky City 11.15 and elsewhere around the country as well. You can check the website nzdf.co.nz. Clive Neeson, thanks so much for your time this morning. Pleasure. Thanks very much, Glenn. The engine has been developed by a sheep farmer 50 years ago.
And the best investment for your kids would be to show them what a paradise it was and still can be. I've seen so many paradises uh, raped and pillaged. We're only here for such a small amount of time and we should be leaving a nice footprint. In the original spirit of extreme pioneers, relive the journey through the most comprehensive collation of stunning original footage.